So, we're doing this. Let's do this. Like before, their hands met in a clasp. But stronger and more decisive. A warm grip. Carrying and a laugh shared between them. So I'd say, we're doing our purchase list and... Then I'll hitch up Guan. But see, you can do the craft work long as the sun's up. I won't need daylight for sanding or scraping first. He dropped, joining her footsteps. He got safety goggles. A whole bunch of them. But only one additional light. How will you check on scratches and smoothness? Got a storm lighter. My eyes are used to and fallen crow light just began. Pardon? What? I mean, the grey days. Cold days, you know? He slipped by her to hold the door for her. Half courteous, a secret grin on his lips. It's cold winter? Not yet, he just said, and with that, he stepped over the threshold, leaving Laurie staring at the empty doorframe, only for a heartbeat. Then she followed him. Hello, hello out there in the world, and welcome to our little podcast, Once Upon a Tale. A place to explore the ancient art of storytelling, but also how it still impacts our modern lives today, and share our personal experiences about. In this second episode, we will look at the dark season, and some stories carrying the many contrasts of those months. That dire look snippet from before already carries a certain something that's naturally arriving with the time of the year. At my family's home in Switzerland, we live quite close to a mountain range. And once a year around November, the same spectacle of nature can be watched. When dozens and dozens of crows or ravens are passing over the mountaintops, traveling southwest. They are darkening the sky so high, their flight is blurred out by layers of fog beneath them, mingling with the clouds and yet their contrast is stark and steady, one murder of corvids after another, a good half an hour long. It really gave me Hitchcock vibes when I watched this for the first time a few years ago, as if those partial migrant birds are the very last heralds that winter is finally coming. Experiences like that really can bring back the supernatural impressions of the olden times. And I can imagine how our ancestors must have felt towards phenomena like this, not only in the time and realms maintaining the tradition of Halloween, During my childhood in Germany, this now international feast was just some strange holiday from the US, only prominent on TV and sort of mixing up carnival or the driving out of winter with collecting sweets for some reason I wouldn't really understand as a kid. But I always wished to take part on a Halloween feast, watching those movies of the 80s and 90s. And when it finally swept over to Europe in the early 2000s, I was thrilled about, even though I was around 17 at the time. Growing up with St. Martin's, St. Nicholas Day and brief knowledge about the season of Epiphany or the Twelfth Tide, we enjoyed those days on a much smaller scale, meeting up with friends and family or in local restaurants. We had many little traditions marking that time, some of them village or county related, like the lantern procession with a brass band marching in front of us kids, crowned with a huge bonfire on the playground 
with one sweet pretzel for each child from a local bakery. Yeast risen, I think. The fluffiest and biggest type of pretzel I've ever eaten since. Most of all, it was coziness and fun and lights we used to share every year with our parents and older and younger siblings and friends or later schoolmates, but always re-exploring well-known stories and songs sprinkled with new ones our teachers and parents digged up from their own childhood. And of course it was the long, long run-up to Christmas, with the days getting darker and shorter, starting with handicrafted advent calendars or Christmas tree decorations. All the important feasts before were already filled with secrets and surprises from our guest room that was my mother's sewing room too in that special time of the year. All my costumes for fashing were hand sewn by her until I was about 10 and on some early childhood Christmas Eves my favorite doll would wear just the same dress as I did in every tiny detail of that needlework. Getting older along with that, I always loved making Christmas gifts myself, or at least decorate them, or to do something creative on the computer, as many of my friends will know. For me, those dark days always carried a feeling of rest and stillness and change at the same time. The magic of the unknown and old known, so to speak that deeply fascinated me and found its way inside my own stories and even in the term and title of Crowlight. So, especially for this episode, I'd like to share some stories with you that sort of haunted me as a kid, in very different ways. Following up Halloween and autumn time, beginning with those that really scared me, revealing glimpses of death and timeless realms, introducing some lesser known works of two famous authors and one particular fairy tale piece that mystified me for almost 30 years. Now, as far as I can remember, I came across the first two stories when I was about eight or ten years old. The inscription of the fairy tale book, gifted by my aunt, actually confirms I received it for my ninth birthday, as a part of a double volume edition. Two anthologies of Astrid Lindgren stories, one titled Fairy Tales, the other one narratives or just tales, as a rough translation. The second book I'm gonna talk about was a collection of scary stories I borrowed from the library. It contained short stories from several authors, and one of them was Bram Stoker. Both stories affected me because I had a very vivid imagination this young age. And just at the beginning of the season, when Halloween came, I told a good friend about how I planned out a quiet audiobook All Hallows Eve for me, because it fell into my family holiday. And when he asked further which books I was about to enjoy, I told him my childhood experience about, and he found it hilarious and asked me back, what kind of crazy ass story is that? And I admitted it was both times owed to the illustrator. Just to stay true how things can impact each other right now, it was this conversation that initiated the idea during this podcast. So to bring that story of Skinny Jack to you, I did a little bit of international research. It was first published in original Swedish in 1986, followed by the first German edition as a picture book in 1987, titled Rup Rüpel, das grausigste Gespenst aus ganz Småland. I can't pronounce the Swedish title here, but I translated it and 
The German title actor early is much closer to the original. It basically says Skinny Jack, the worst of all ghosts in Smallland. Which is particularly interesting because instead of worst, the German title says here grausig meaning ghostly, grisly or gruesome. As well as Skinny Jack's German name gives a few more hints to his character. Rup Rüpel means a gruff, abrasive, unceremonious person, while Rüpel is a loud ruffian or bully. The first children's book publication in English language was in 1988. And because the single book editions are out of print in English and German book publishing, I tried my luck like the true book lover I am and purchased a second-hand edition from the Library Company of Burlington, according to the original library card and all that. So, let's dive into it. To begin with Astrid Lindgren's own point of view. All international book editions of her were illustrated by the same artist, Elon Wigland, who worked together with Lindgren for 30 years since 1953. Quoted from the German biography Astrid Lindgren, Ihr Leben, by Jens Andersen, Astrid once expressed how much those illustrations meant to her, as I translated, with your pictures, you have helped my books to reach their readers. Many children will remember these pictures you created for their entire lives. They will be an unforgettable part of their childhood. And holy moly, is that true. In comparison, I found out the single children's book edition has summer pictures inside, emphasizing the homeliness in the story before and between the scary parts. In my anthology, still available on the market, by the way, the creepy pictures are more prominent, and great parts of it are left to a young reader's imagination. The single volume's title motive is marking the peak in the arc of suspense. Therefore, in the fairy tale book, it's quite in the middle of the story one of two pictures that appear to show a corpse. So let me tell you, flipping that book open the very first times and seeing those pictures right at the beginning was almost too much for me. I used to skip those pages really fast after choosing any other tale from the index, and I actually was surprised to find out it really is the first one introduced in that fairy tale collection when I digged it up for this podcast again. At some point while reading the book for the first time, I confided to my mom how scared I was by the pictures alone. And she said something very comprehensible. Why don't you give it a try? Maybe the story is less scary than the pictures. So I gave it a try. And the true charm of it is, it tells a story within a story. And as it turned out, a little girl as the narrator also goes through too much of her own imagination after hearing Skinny Jack's story from her grandma. Nevertheless, my fears were right about the scary part. And here is why. Grandma's cottage had just one room and a kitchen, but upstairs there was a little attic. There were lots of interesting things up there, and when we visited her she usually found something to give us as a present. Now, after Grandma had finished telling us about Skinny Jack, she disappeared up into the attic. After a while, she came down with an old guitar for my brother and a bundle of old illustrated magazines for me. How heavy my present was! But Grandma had a good idea. She put the bundle in her sack and tied it over my shoulder. Now it was easy to carry. You'd better hurry home before it gets dark, said Grandma. So we thanked her, said goodbye, and were out of the door before she could blink an eye. We can walk up on the ridge, said my brother, and as usual I did what he wanted. There was a narrow, bumpy road at the foot of the ridge that sensible people used and we should have taken it too, if we cared at all about getting home before it got too dark. But my brother started climbing up the ridge, plucking his guitar, and I scrambled up after him. Up on the ridge, 
There was a little path between the firs and the pines. It was like walking through a hall with pillars. Usually, I thought it was mysterious and grand, but just then, at twilight, it was nothing less than creepy. Besides, I was getting tired, and the sack was very heavy. I just wished that I were home. I couldn't walk as fast as my brother, and I started to lag behind. He was already far ahead of me, strumming the guitar to his heart's content. Finally, he noticed I wasn't with him any longer. What's the matter? he called. Is the sack too heavy for you? And then I shouted back. I still shudder when I think of it. I shouted, yes, it's heavy. I'd rather carry Skinny Jack. How could I have blurted out something so awful? Why did I ever say such a thing? Ghosts come when they are called by name. I knew that. How could I have been so stupid? And now the ghost of Skinny Jack was probably sneaking through the trees. Any minute now, he would appear and say in his horrible ghost voice, Aha! So you would like to carry me, would you? Well, you'll get your wish then. I tried screaming for my brother, but he didn't hear me. He was playing his guitar so loudly. We were on our way down the other side of the witch now. At the bottom was a hazelnut thicket that we had to go through to get to the road. My brother disappeared into it and I was scared to death. I was far behind him now and I felt more alone and abandoned than anyone else on earth. I couldn't go one step further, but I had to. I knew that Skinny Jack was hiding somewhere in the darkness. I had to catch up with my brother. He was in the hazelnut thicket. I could hear his guitar. I went crying and gasping after him. And that's when Skinny Jack grabbed me. Yes, he grabbed me. With his girlish hands, he grabbed me from behind and held me fast. I screamed, but he didn't let go. I screamed until my blood turned to ice. I was finished. I knew that. Nothing could save me now. Researching the story's origin for this episode held another surprise for me. Several sources in English and German are stating that in one interview, Astrid Lindgren admitted she had a similar experience as the narrator girl when she was young, and that she had, in fact, the story from her own grandma, Ida Ingström, even up to the detail with the guitar her brother Gunnar Eriksson got as a gift that evening. She only changed a few other details, and from the point on, quote, started to lie when both children got on their long way home in the book. Coming full circle here with my own childhood memories, this is exactly why the art of storytelling is so fascinating. I mean, one story by itself can evoke just the same feelings through generations of children. Even fixed on paper or told in old words, bound to legends or traditions, They live on constantly, coming and going and changing like seasons, yet all familiar in shapes and colors. Besides well-known and timeless tales like Frankenstein or fairy tales like Hansel and Gretel, I always loved old and mysterious stories carrying the views and beliefs of bygone times in their setting and language. One of my first big heroes was Robin Hood and one of the earliest versions I read and still own this well-worn volume was the Howard Pyle version basing on the original ballad of the legend. I remember how curious I found the archaic language and all those English names I barely knew how to pronounce as an eight-year-old kid. Now, the second story I am going to introduce left its first impression on me when I was older. I was about 10 when I had a fondness for scary story collections from the library and in one of them, Bram Stoker's The Judge's House just left me distraught. 
interesting enough, I was very aware of that being a combination of an actual illustration in the book and how the author painted pictures with words. That combined made the very illustration come to life in my child's mind. So I imagined it looked at me. I was so scared, I threw the book on my reading blanket and ran out of the room. But at the same time, I was kind of embarrassed about being such a baby, that I ended up pretending just taking a glass of water from the kitchen in front of my mom. Indeed, I was so bewildered of my own reaction, that a few years later, I borrowed it for a second time, just to see if it had the very same effect on my imagination. The picture description within the story is a stylistic main device. It still gives me pleasant shivers in both languages, and I admire how deftly it's embedded into the plot. For an hour or so, he worked all right, and then his thoughts began to wander from his books. The actual circumstances around him, the calls on his physical attention, and his nervous susceptibility were not to be denied. By this time, the wind had become a gale, and the gale a storm. The old house, solid though it was, seemed to shake to its foundations. And the storm roared and raged through its many chimneys and its queer old gables, producing strange unearthly sounds in the empty rooms and corridors. Even the great alarm bell on the roof must have felt the force of the wind, for the rope rose and fell slightly, as though the bell were moved a little from time to time, and the limbo rope fell on the oak floor with a hard and hollow sound. As Malcolm then listened to it, he bethought himself of the doctor's words. It is the rope which the hangman used for the victims of the judge's judicial rancor. And he went over to the corner of the fireplace and took it in his hands to look at it. There seemed a sort of deadly interest in it. And as he stood there, he lost himself for a moment in speculation as to who these victims were, and the grim wish of the judge to have such a ghastly relic ever under his eyes. As he stood there, the swaying of the bell on the roof still lifted the rope now and again. But presently there came a new sensation, a sort of tremor in the rope, as though something was moving along it. Looking up instinctively, Malcolmson saw the great rat coming slowly down towards him, glaring at him steadily. He dropped the rope and started back with a muttered curse, and the rat turning ran up the rope again and disappeared. And at the same instant, Malcolmson became conscious that the noise of the rats, which had ceased for a while, began again. All this set him thinking and it occurred to him that he had not investigated the layer of the rat or looked at the pictures as he had intended. He lit the other lamp without the shade and holding it up, went and stood opposite the third picture from the fireplace on the right-hand side, where he had seen the rat disappear on the previous night. At the first glance, he started back so suddenly that he almost dropped the lamp and a deadly pallor overspread his face. His knees shook and heavy drops of sweat came on his forehead and he trembled like an aspen. But he was young and plucky and pulled himself together and after the pause of a few seconds, stepped forward again, raised the lamp and examined the picture, which had been dusted and washed and now stood out clearly. It was of a judge, dressed in his robes of scarlet and ermine. His face was strong and merciless, evil, crafty, and vindictive. With a sensual mouth, 
hooked nose of ruddy color and shaped like the beak of a bird of prey. The rest of the face was of a cadaverous color. The eyes were of peculiar brilliance and with a terribly malignant expression. As he looked at them, Malcolmson grew cold, for he saw there the very counterpart of the eyes of the great rat. The lamp almost fell from his hand. He saw the rat with its baleful eyes peering out through the hole in the corner of the picture and noted the sudden cessation of the noise of the other rats. However, he pulled himself together and went on with his examination of the picture. The judge was seated in a great high-backed carved oak chair. On the right-hand side of a great stone fireplace where in the corner a rope hung down from the ceiling, its end lying coiled on the floor. With a feeling of something like horror, Malcolmson recognized the scene of the room as it stood and gazed around him in an awestruck manner as though he expected to find some strange presence behind him. Then he looked over to the corner of the fireplace and with a loud <gasps> cry he let the lamb fall from him. There, in the judge's armchair, with the rope hanging behind, sat the rat with the judge's baleful eyes, now intensified and with a fiendish leer. Save for the howling of the storm without there, was silence. Now, I have many such plot twists or rhetorical gimmicks that impressed and influenced me as a kid. And I won't spoil the ending for you except for it hit me really unexpected that young age. But I would also learn from those stories and already tested speaking to and playing with my readers, writing my own stuff for school or at home. While today it is so easy to research origins and backgrounds of a story online, back then I had only non-fiction books, magazine articles or literature adaptions and documentaries on TV. And learning further about specific themes, I found it quite a strange thing how folk tales and fairy tales can have so many different versions and yet tell the same story only with different middle parts, dramaturgic transitions and outcomes. But between all of them, there was one fairy tale that stood out, because I only heard it once when I was three or four. It never came across it again for a very long time. All I could remember was how it weirded me out and spellbound me when my aunt read it to me and my older cousin. How it told about a young girl that wandered into a fairy meadow or clearing by accident, befriended one particular fairy but had to keep silent about, and when she broke that promise, the mystic fairy patch was gone overnight. I also vaguely remembered that somehow, in just one night, several years had passed in that story, and both of that really haunted me that night, I heard it for the very first time. But when I asked my aunt about it, she barely could remember one old fairy tale book from her great-grandma somewhere in her attic. Combing through Brothers Grimm, Anderson, Charles Perrault and Ludwig Beckstein had brought nothing. So it was a chance find in 2016 that finally solved that mystery. It was a German YouTube audiobook channel recommended to me, suddenly popping up with that thumbnail saying, The Elves by Ludwig Tieck. I gave it a listen and quick Google search and was vowed I had finally found what I'd been searching for so long I already had questioned my own memory about. Rediscovering it, I found out that tale is written in a very old, over-embellished language. Even in an English download version I searched up for this podcast, it was first published in 1812 in a fantasy three-volume edition of Ludwig Tieck and first translated for a book called German Romans by Thomas Carlyle in 1827. 
I was really surprised how wide-ranging the introduced mythological creatures within that story are. So here's my little glimpse of that Wanderer's piece for you. Why are ye all so glad? inquired Mary, bending to her fair playmate, who seemed smaller than yesterday. The king is coming, said the little one. Many of us have never seen him, and whithersoever he turns his face, there is happiness and mirth. We have long looked for him, more anxiously than you look fixed spring, when winter lingers with you. And now he has announced by his fair herald that he is at hand. This wise and glorious bird that has been sent to us by the king is called Phoenix. He dwells far off in Arabia on a tree which there is no other that resembles it on earth. As in like manner there is no second Phoenix. When he feels himself grown old, he builds himself a pile of balm and incense, kindles it and dies singing. And then from the fragrant ashes Soars up the renewed phoenix with unlessened beauty. It is seldom he so wings his course that men behold him, and when once in centuries this does occur, they note it in their annals and expect remarkable events. But now, my friend, thou and I must part, for the sight of the king is not permitted thee. Then the lady with the golden rope came through the throng and beckoning Mary to her, led her into a sequestered walk. Thou must leave us, my dear child, said she. The king is to hold his court here for twenty years, perhaps longer, and fruitfulness and blessings will spread far over the land. But chiefly here beside us, all the brooks and rivulets will become more bountiful, all the fields and gardens richer, the wine more generous the meadows more fertile, and the woods more fresh and green. A milder air will blow, no hail shall hurt, no flood shall threaten. Take the swing and think of us, but beware of telling anyone of our existence. Or we must fly this land, and thou and all around will lose the happiness and blessing of our neighborhood. Once more kiss thy playmate and farewell. They issued from the walk, Serena wept, Mary stooped to embrace her, and they parted. Already she was on the narrow bridge. The cold air was blowing on her back from the first. The little dog barked with all its might and rang its little bell. She looked round, then hastened over, for the darkness of the first, the bleakness of the ruined huts, the shadows of the twilight, were filling her with terror. What a night my parents must have had on my account, said she within herself as she stepped on the green. And I dare not tell them where I have been, or what wonders I have witnessed, nor indeed would they believe me. Two men passing by saluted her, and as they went along she heard them say, What a pretty girl! Where can she come from? With quickened steps she approached the house. But the trees which were hanging last night, loaded with fruit, were now standing dry and leafless. The house was differently painted, and a new barn had been built beside it. Mary was amazed and thought she must be dreaming. In this perplexity, she opened the door. And behind the table sat her father, between an unknown woman and a stranger youth. Good God, father, cried she, where's my mother? Thy mother, said the woman, with a forecasting tone, and sprang towards her. Ha, ah, thou surely can't not. Yes, indeed, indeed thou art my lost, long lost, dear, only Mary. She had recognized her by a little brown mole beneath the chin, as well as by her eyes and shape. All embraced her, all were moved with joy. 
and the parents wept. Mary was astonished that she almost reached to her father's stature, and she could not understand how her mother had become so changed and faded. She asked the name of the stranger youth. It is our neighbor's son, Andres, said Martin. How comest thou to us again so unexpectedly after seven long years? Where hast thou been? Why didst thou never send us tidings of thee? Seven years, said Mary, and could not order her ideas and recollections. Seven whole years? Yes, yes, said Andres, laughing and shaking her trustfully by the hand. I have won the race, good Mary. I was at the pier tree and back again seven years ago, and thou, sluggish creature, art but just returned. They again asked, they pressed her, but remembering her instruction, she could answer nothing. It was they themselves chiefly that, by degrees, shaped a story for her. How having lost her way, she had been taken up by a coach and carried to a strange remote part where she could not give the people any notion of her parents' residence, how she was conducted to a distant town where certain worthy persons brought her up and loved her, how they had lately died, and at length she had recollected her birthplace and so returned. Now matter how it is, exclaimed her mother, enough that we have thee again, my little daughter, my own, my all. Andres waited supper, and Mary could not be at home in anything she saw. The house seemed small and dark. She felt astonished at her dress, which was clean and simple, but appeared quite foreign. She looked at the ring on her finger, and the gold of it glittered strangely, enclosing a stone of burning red. To her father's question she replied that the ring also was a present from her benefactors. She was glad when the hour of sleep arrived, and she hastened to her bed. Next morning she felt much more collected. She had now arranged her thoughts a little, and could better stand the questions of the people in the village, all of whom came in to bid her welcome. Andres was there too, with the earliest active, glad, and serviceable beyond all others. The blooming maiden of fifteen had made a deep impression on him. He had passed a sleepless night. The people of the castle likewise sent for Mary, and she had once more to tell her story to them, which was now grown quite familiar to her. The old count and his lady were surprised at her good breeding. She was modest, but not embarrassed. She made answer courteously, in good phrases to all their questions. All fear of noble persons and their equipage had passed away from her. For when she measured these halls and forms by the wonders and high beauty she had seen with the elves in the hidden abode, this earthly splendor seemed but dim to her. The presence of man was almost mean. The young lords were charmed with her beauty. Just to give you a hint on the further progress, Mary and Andres become married to each other and they are given an elven-blessed child. If you are interested in reading both full stories, I will put the links in the description box. And revisiting how seasons fly with the gentry, I really hope you enjoyed this very belated winter episode. The mythology research for Crowlight carried me through this dark season, and by sharing those special feelings of storytelling, I'd love to bring back the old customs of shortening and perhaps brightening the lasting court days until spring carries us along. For submitting your own stories about books or a personal fascination for storytelling that impacted your life, please take the email address in the video description. For this episode I say thank you for listening and goodbye till our next Trove of Tales. See ya!